Good morning, everyone. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Sunday in Christ. Um, if you're not, I pray that we all get strengthened together in Christ. So I start by asking one question. What is a repentant heart? This is something that we have heard of many times and, you know, Christ enters the picture and what does Christ have to do? And, um, uh, you know, me personally, I thought that this was something traditional. I thought that having a repentant heart and, you know, um, uh, us actually remembering Christ's death and the way Christ has lived was actually something traditional. But it wasn't. It wasn't when I've noticed, when I've got in touch with three concepts. Sin, separation from God, and the depth we have with God. I've talked with, a, with, with some people, and normally they tell me, you know, going to church and being a Christian is like learning one lesson over and over again. Like, you know, Christ died for your sins, yes, I know, and all that stuff. But then I told them, wait, it seems that way because you're not yet in touch with what the Bible has to offer. Some people, I could say John Lennox, for example, have have gone through so much and it's still not enough. They have experienced so much. They it, it's still not enough. And um, at some point in time, you probably think that you're all the way up there, but then you notice that you know almost nothing of reality. So, and for for some other people, Christianity is like. You have this book, and you need to follow these set of rules, and you're okay. You know, all you have to do is just follow them, and that's it. You have a place in heaven, you're okay. No. I emphasize no. If righteousness was, this is a, it's like a mini, mini quotation from Galatians 2, verse 9, verse 20. If righteousness was through the law, then Christ died to no purpose. And this is a really good um, uh, explanation, because if righteousness was through those 613 laws, which we have been learning through Romans lately, then we don't need Christ because we are self-righteous. But it is because of those laws that we do need Christ because we can't follow them. So here, it's, it's creating a big contrast between us and God because only God here could make the rules. We can't make the rules. Only God could objectively make the rules. And this is something which many atheists have to not understand but admit. They have to admit that they can't be morally obliged to something without God, because God is all loving, is all good, and is the standard of, by which any of us could function, not just as a church, but also as a community. And, um, uh, and, it's not, and people try to twist 
scripture and people try to, you know, do whatever they want because man doesn't want to change. But man wants to change God. Man wants to be God in order to do whatever he wants to do. And this is why, brothers and sisters, this is why we do need Christ. This is not just something traditional, something that we've learned at church or something, you know. This is real. And it doesn't get any real than real. Um, all which is wrong is us. You know, our lives are imperfect, bodies are imperfect, our thoughts are imperfect. All which is right and all which is holy is him. So what does a repentant heart have to do? Of course, we do need a repentant heart to realize our depth that we have with God. And um, uh, this is why salvation must be gifted to us and it is impossible for us to earn. It has always been this way. It is impossible for us to earn salvation because we can't even... So they, they found it difficult to follow Ten Commandments when the Ten were, were um, available. How, how are we going to follow 600 and 613? It's, it's like it, it's impossible at this point. So um, um, this is why it has to be gifted to us. And it cannot, it, it can't be gifted to us without Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. And without God actually judging us and being like, okay, I'm going to give you what you deserve. No. Instead, instead, he sent his son to die on the cross in our places. It's, he's all loving, all knowing, all powerful. And uh, it doesn't get any more joyful and any better than this. Um, uh, I guess I had to say what I had to say, so I'm going to pray for us. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here. Lord, we thank you that you're all good and all knowing and all powerful. And we stand, we stand as nothing compared to your majesty. Lord, we try to doubt your majesty and try to manipulate what you have already objectively told us, but we, we seem to try and be gods, when in reality what we are doing is that we are sinning. And that is a, it's a great mistake against you, and which um, uh, requires accounting. So, Lord, we thank you f that, that you're good. We thank you that um, uh, you've sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross so we could be able to call you Father and have a place in the, with you in heaven forever and ever. Amen. Amen. But how can they call to him for help if they have not believed? And how can they believe if they have not heard the message? And how can they hear if the message is not proclaimed? And how can the message be proclaimed if the messengers are not sent out? As the scripture says, how wonderful is the coming of messengers who bring good news. But not all have accepted the good news. Isaiah himself said, Lord, who believed our message? So then, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. But I ask, is it true that they did not hear the message? Of course they did. The sound of their voice went out to all the world. Their words reached the ends of the earth. Again, I ask, did the people of Israel not understand? Moses himself is the first one to answer. I will use a so-called nation to make my people jealous, and by means of a nation of fools, I will make my people angry. And Isaiah is even bolder when he says, 
I was found by those who were not looking for me. I appeared to those who were not asking for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I held out my hands to welcome a disobedient and rebellious people. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It excites me so much seeing our youths, our young ones getting involved in, in the work of the Lord. It fills my heart with joy. And today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a subject that is, that, that is very important in our lives. And the title for this message is called The Necessity, the Importance of Evangelism. Now, evangelism is an essential part of God's plan. And it involves worldwide proclamation of the gospel, the good news. Now, the church doesn't need a vision or a mission to know what to do. God already has a mission. And God is looking for the church to be involved. God wants the church to join Jesus in the work that he is doing. Jesus is always at work and he is looking for people to say, to willingly say, Lord, here I am, send me. I am available and I want to partner with what you are doing. This is what the Lord is looking for. People, like the prophet Isaiah said, Lord, here I am. I'm a man of unclean lips, but send me. I am available, and I want to partner with what you are doing. Now, a principle for life, um, some of you may have heard it, especially if, if you have children. And this principle for life is sharing is caring. Now, uh, as I said, those, fam those with, ch with children are familiar with this, with this, with this principle. I have two boys. And uh, when, uh, when they're playing with something, both of them, they want the same exact thing. And they're always fighting for the same thing. So I approach, I approach them, and I try to instill this principle in their heads. So I go next to them, I tell them, especially I, um, I approach my eldest son, and I tell him, hey, Noah, sharing is caring. But there is nothing worse in this world. When your children use this principle against you, especially when I'm eating my chocolate. After a long day, and I'm waiting for a good treat after dinner, as soon as I sit down and I start unwrapping my chocolate, my son goes, hey, daddy, you know what? Sharing is caring. And I tell him, no, 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 no. If you really care for your father, let him eat his chocolate. Also, if you really care, go get me your chocolate, and I eat it also. No, I, I don't say that, but that's what I want to do. Now, joking aside, the idea of sharing is caring is people sharing what they have. And as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have the good news. We have Jesus Christ himself. And this should fill our hearts with joy. But we live in a time and age where, where the world gets offended when the church shares its faith. Everybody shares about what gets them excited. A good restaurant, a good TV show, uh, football, cars, clothes, whatever it is. And you can share about those things, but it's important that you don't share your beliefs. You don't share your faith because, you know, that's, that's personal and that might be offensive. That's how this world thinks. But brothers and sisters, we should not be ashamed of our faith. 
we surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. And there is nothing, nothing better and more satisfying in this world than serving Jesus. Serving God himself. Serving the creator. As scripture says, we are not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Listen, all of us, all of us, if we know Jesus and we know that he is doing a mighty work in us, let us never, never be ashamed of him. No matter the circumstances, no matter the age we're living in, no matter what they tell us, let us never be ashamed of Jesus. And it must be every believer's desire to see the unsaved experience the transforming love of Jesus Christ. From enemies of God, condemned to hell, transformed, changed to children of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We should long for that thing. We should long that the unsaved come to know Christ, starting with our families, our friends, our neighbors. There should be an urge in us to preach the gospel to these people. If you remember from last week, Paul in Romans 10, 13 quotes the prophet Joel. And he says, everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is the same promise that Peter cited on the day of Pentecost. And it is also the context um, that we're going to use for today's portion of scripture. Now, as, as, um, as you noticed in, in, the, in the scriptures that we read, Paul asks a series of questions. But essentially, he is asking, what are the prerequisites of calling the Lord? What must be done before to call on the Lord? And in each question, Paul points to a prior condition necessary to, fill, to fulfill that step. So question one goes in Romans 10 verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Now, what is the basis for calling the Lord? The basis for calling the Lord is believing. I think that's simple enough. Yet in order to believe, the sinner needs to know about Jesus. That he died, rose again for each and every one of us for our sins. Then because he or she believes, the sinner calls on the Lord. Question two, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Just as believing precedes calling, hearing precedes believing. The sinner cannot believe in Christ until he or she hear Jesus speaking directly through to them through his messengers. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So sinners need to hear Jesus speaking through each and every one of us. We are his ambassadors. We are his messengers. Now question three. How can they hear without someone preaching. God uses both men and women to preach the good news. And while we are saved by faith in Jesus and not good works, nevertheless, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. To do what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance he, pre he prepared them in advance for us, for us to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. So one of these good works is the proclamation. 
the preaching, the sharing of the good news. So we are not saved by good works. We are saved by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But that salvation will cause us to do good works. And as we heard also during the breaking of bread and even what Diego said this morning, the Lord commissioned us and he wants us to share the good news with all people. Question four. How can they preach unless they are sent? Romans 10, 15. Now let's ask, who sends the messenger? Was Paul thinking of his own experience? Paul insisted that Jesus Christ, the chief apostle. Now what, what, what is an apostle? An apostle is someone sent. Jesus was sent by God. So Paul insisted that Jesus Christ called and commissioned him. Furthermore, the church at Antioch recognized and confirmed this call. And under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the church sent Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And you can refer this uh, in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. So here we can see three agents involved. Three agents involved in this, in this sending process. We have Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church. But the question is, let us, let us ask ourselves, is there a practical aspect to sending? What does this mean? Can we be involved practically in sending someone? To simplify things, let me give you an example. Where do the messenger, where do the messengers, the preachers, living expenses, come from? Do they fall from the sky? We know that the Lord provides. We know that if he wants, he, he, can, he can make things fall from the sky. But what can we do? What does this suggest to us? Our responsibilities. Brothers and sisters, giving is vital. And um, I was looking at some American statistics. I don't know how the, the Maltese statistics looks. But the majority of American Christians spend more money on dog food than giving to the church. Now, I'm not saying that feeding animals is a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing. But if we look at our priorities, it will, it will tell us a lot. Spending more money on dog food than investing in the kingdom of God. Remember that when giving, you are blessing someone and you are blessing yourself. Acts 20 verse 35 says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, coming to Romans 10, verse 15, the word preach here means to announce, to publish, or to proclaim something. But Paul specifically speaks about the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching the good news. And this is not limited to a pulpit, or a church building, or a formal setting, or maybe a certain kind of people. No. We are all responsible to share the gospel. It is the privilege and the responsibility of every believer to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure that at one point or another, you heard the saying, actions speak louder than words. And if we say that we are followers of Jesus, but we live like the devil, or else do whatever we please, then our words, our preaching, our sharing will be powerless. It will have no moral authority. So it's important that 
our actions reflect the character and the attitude of Christ. Now, many today long for good, healthy relationships. And um, a very effective way to evangelize is called relational evangelism. What does this mean? It means building relationship with someone in context to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this brings with it a lot of responsibilities because um, it's not like handing out a tract to someone and most probably you'll never see him again. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it doesn't have the responsibilities that this kind of evangelism has. When you are building relationship with someone, in order for you to preach the gospel, that someone is looking at you and expecting to see Christ's likeness in you. So this brings a lot of responsibility. As we heard already, we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. So let's let our actions, our attitudes, our character reflect Jesus Christ. And once we build relationship with these people and start trusting us, they might be more receptive to the good news of salvation. But actions need words also. It is important that we speak. Because imagine, let's say I go, to, I go to a coffee shop and I stay the farthest possible from anyone. I sit down, open my Bible, read my Bible while I'm, while I'm sipping some coffee, gift a very, give, give a very good tip to the waiter, and then just leave. Did I share the gospel? All right, they might notice that I was reading my Bible. They might say, oh, he gave us a really good tip. But did I share the gospel? No. So we need to use words. Now, because, because of time's sake, I have, to, I have to close. So as Paul continues in the following verses, just like the Jews, not all who hear will believe. Not all who hear will believe. So it is important that even those people we're building relationship with, it's important that we constantly pray for them. We constantly pray that the Lord will prepare, will soften their hearts so they will accept the good news. Now, um, if I look, if I look in, in this building, let's say we're 10 of us. And uh, each and every one of us has a list of unsaved friends or family members. Let's say we have 10, each, each of us. And we start praying for them. So then we'll have 100 potential new believers. Wouldn't that bring new life in the church? Wouldn't that be exciting in the church? As I told you earlier, I get excited when I see the younger generation growing in the Lord. Imagine you people coming in the church, not coming from other churches, but people who are unsaved coming to know the Lord because you were responsible enough to share the gospel. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you, I urge you, I pray that we will have that urge to reach the lost. We are living in hard times. We are living in dark times. People are going to hell and they don't even know it. And we have the good news of Jesus. And many times, even as my brother mentioned, many times we're just sitting lazy, thanking the Lord for salvation, but doing nothing about it. Lord, have mercy. So, brothers and sisters, as I said, not everyone who here will accept the message. But that's not our problem. Our job is to share the gospel. After all, as I said already, sharing is caring. And to close, I'm going to read scripture from Romans also. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And let this be each and every one of us. 
in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for, for your precious word, word. Lord, as we heard today, as we sang today, I thank you for your calling. Thank you for calling each and every one of us. And yes, Lord, you set us apart. Help us, Lord, to get rid of anything which hinders our relationship with you. Mold us, change us, break us, Lord, so we will look more like you. So when our unsaved family, our unsaved friends and neighbors, when they will look at us, they will see, wow, they have something different. What is it that they have? And the answer would be you, Jesus. We have you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, Lord. We thank you for the cross. Thank you for sa saving a sinner like me. I didn't deserve anything, Lord, but your wrath. But when I was, when I was your enemy, you died for me. You died for us. Lord Jesus, let us not be selfish and keep this gift to us. Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us to go into our workplaces, in our schools, at the grocery shop, supermarket, wherever we are, Lord. Help us. Help us to look at those opportunities or make those opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The hope of glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus.